Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Good afternoon. My name is Mitch Davis, and on behalf of the Franklin Church of Christ, we would love to welcome you to our Sunday afternoon worship service. Speaking of worship services, we want to invite you to come and worship with us because our doors are open. We are here on Sundays at 10 a.m. and again on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Well, we hope you are edified by today's service. Will you pray with me? Dear the Father, we come to you today thanking you for all that you've given us in our lives, Father. We thank you for the nation that we have, we thank you for the families that we have, and we thank you for this church that we have, Father. We thank you for Jesus who died on our sins on the cross, Father. We thank you for the great sacrifice that was shed with that blood, the perfect lamb, so we can be with you eternity in heaven, Father. Father, as we get to begin worshiping, we pray that we open our minds and our hearts to the messages and apply it to our lives. And we pray with those that aren't here today, and if it's your will, help them get better so they can once be again be with us. In Christ's name we pray. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. prepared to take the Lord's Supper. I have a few comments. In Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, we read about two of Jesus' disciples who are walking to the village of Emmaus. These disciples are perplexed about Jesus' cru crucifixion and wondering at his reported resurrection. As they walked and talked, Jesus joined them and questioned them. And then he explained the prophecies concerning himself and why the Messiah had to die. But the two disciples were prevented from recognizing Jesus. When they arrived in Emmaus, the disciples invited Jesus to stop and eat with them. Luke records the following in chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. It strikes me as important that it is when Jesus gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to them that these two disciples finally recognized that they were with 
the risen Jesus. But the passage goes on in verse 32 to say how they felt when this stranger was explaining the prophecies concerning the Messiah while they were walking with him to Emmaus. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? In verse 31, when their eyes were opened and they recognized him, the word recognized in the New American Standard Bible, or they knew him in the New King James Version, is from the Greek word epigonosko. This word in English means to recognize, to be fully acquainted with, to know or acknowledge. And that takes us back to verse 32, where these two disciples say, were not our hearts burning within us? Don't we want our hearts to be burning within us as we read the Bible and as we recognize, know, and acknowledge Jesus? Now we're about to engage in the primary way we remember that we acknowledge and recognize the sacrifice of our Savior, the Lord's Supper. Before his trials and crucifixion, Jesus ate his final Passover meal with his disciples. It is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians that during this meal, Jesus chose eating bread to represent his body and drinking the fruit of the vine to represent his blood as the way he wanted his people, his disciples, to remember him. Both Luke and 1 Corinthians record Jesus as saying, Do this in remembrance of me. And when we remember Jesus in this way, maybe our hearts will burn within us, and we will recognize that Jesus is our Savior, that we are to be fully acquainted with his sacrifice, and that we acknowledge the great price paid by Jesus to set us free from our sins. Let us eat the Lord's Supper. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread that helps us remember Jesus' body on the cross. And we recognize that only by his sacrifice do we have hope to be in heaven with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray with me again. Holy Father, thank you for the blood of your Son represented in this fruit of the vine. We acknowledge that the blood of Jesus shed on the cross is the only way our sins are forgiven. In his name we pray. Amen. There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode, a city with foundations firm as the eternal throne. 
desolations shall ever move a stone. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in Thee? No night is there, no sorrow, no death and no of its King. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell Scripture reading this morning will be Revelations 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. Good evening, family. Today is going to be a great day, and family, I have a lot of information, so I pray that you stay with me and that we're able to get this out, okay? I also believe that if you pay attention to the lesson and use what you learn in your everyday life, it will benefit you greatly and it will strengthen your relationship with Christ. Family, let us start without any further ado. We're in Revelation chapter 3 today, verses hmm, 14, let, no, 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 we're in, yes, verses 14 down to 23, 22. And sure enough, what we're going to find in these passages is that from chapter one to chapter three in the book of Revelation, we see these letters to the churches. Now, the seven churches are churches that aren't the only seven churches, but they're churches that matter. They're the early churches. And Jesus has a letter to them uh, before AD 70. He has a letter to them before things get really bad for the Israelites at that period in time. Some of the letters are good. Some of the letters are bad. Luckily for us, what we're going to study today is the Church of Laodicea's letter. The Church of Laodicea has a letter that doesn't say that they're doing great, but it also doesn't say that they're doing uh, bad either, terribly either. And sure enough, a lot of us may fall into that category. A lot of us may be thinking that things are going as good as they're going to get, yet we know that through Christ, uh, who strengthens us all and who can do all things, that our life could be better. Our relationship with God could be better. And the Church of Laodicea may have been missing that. So Jesus actually tells them about themselves. Let us see what he has to say. Verse 15, Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Family, some of the things that I have here for us to understand is first, God knows our works. Yes, he knew the church's work back then. Now, did he have to tell them? Maybe not. 
but a good reminder never hurts, right? So that's the first thing I want us to understand is that God does know our works. Jesus ultimately maybe have died, maybe have ascended to heaven, maybe sitting on the right throne of God, yet all of that included, he still knows our works. And because he knows our works, this is what he has to say about this church in particular, which a lot of us may fall into this category, but keep in mind what the word has to say. It says that, uh, I, 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 verse 16, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my out of my mouth. I want us to also know the second thing is that God may be done with a lot of people, but until he's fully done with you, he's never done with you. You see, Jesus lets them know about themselves and he tells them, I'm ready to spit you out. I'm tired of you. I don't like lukewarm. And sure enough, instead of saying, I have spit you out or I have spat you out, he says, I will spit you out. That means that in the future, I will. So you haven't done it yet. Lord, what may I do so that you don't spit me out? How may I become hot for you, Lord? How may I prove that I am yours? Fully dedicated. Well, this is what he has to say next. Uh, he tells him in verse 16 or verse 17, for you say that I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing. Family, before we get too far into that, I want you to understand that what many Western Christians suffer from, I included, is selfishness, greed. And not this corporate or political selfishness and greed that we see about on the news, but just the individual person to person. If there was a survivor, it should be me mentality that 90%, if not 99% of us have on this side of the ocean. And so when I see what God has to say to us, I know that he's speaking to a Middle Eastern area, but the word of God goes into all corners of the earth. So I must internalize it to where uh, I best possibly can. And sure enough, I can see what he has to say right here. Another note that I want you to make before we get too deep into that is that uh, although God has not spit them out yet or given up on them, he will. And since he will, we must accept his reproof. OK, and not only accept his reproof, but show ourselves to be faithful, just like they were to show themselves to be faithful. You see, there's a passage that we're about to read here soon uh, in church, Matthew, chapter 13, verse 15. And he talks about lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn. Shall I heal them? And when you remember a passage like that, then as we keep reading, you'll understand what Jesus is about to get into. You see, Jesus is very powerful. And what he needs us to understand is that some of the things that we have in front of our way for the world are actually in front of us uh, or slowing us down spiritually. So look what he says in verse 18 and verse 17. For you say that I am rich, I have prospered and need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Notice family that although God is ready to be done with these individuals, although Christ is ready to spit them out, he lets them know about themselves. He says, I'm ready to spit you out because of this. You say because you're rich, right, that you're OK, you prospered, you don't need anything yet. You don't realize because you're a little blind, you're a little deaf, you're a little disoriented. You're not me. So you don't see that you're actually pitiful. You're actually wretched. You're actually blind. You're actually naked. You don't see that. And what he tells them is the things that you find your security in family. Yes, they may be worldly. They may be able to be bought with your riches or with your clout or with your name. But ultimately, they don't serve you any natural purpose because I am the author and finisher of your faith. Now, how do we come to that conclusion, Zach? How do we come to that conclusion is because, family, we read where God uh, is telling them that they're growing apart from him. Yet it's not a mutual growing apart like some relationships or friendships. He's saying that I'm right here and you're growing apart from me. You're becoming lukewarm. You're not hot or cold. I don't know who I'm dealing with. And because that's the case, let me tell you about yourself. Once I tell you about yourself, this is what you can do to fix it. How about you start buying your gold from me? That's where you get your security from, right? 
We know from different passages in the Bible that God's wisdom is worth more than gold. We read in passages of the Bible that God's righteousness is worth more than silver, worth more than anything. And sure enough, if we go ahead and start purchasing the currency that God says is more valuable than anything, and we start stacking that up, just like we would stack up gold, it's been refined, tested, tried, and is true through time, through life, through everything, because God's principles can't be erased. They can't be stepped on. So notice also what he says. He says, get from me the gold that you would like so that you'll actually be rich and white garments so that uh, you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Back in those days, purple, white, those things were expensive. You see, white, it was hard to keep it white and white was also just hard to get. So sure enough, he's saying, don't don't go out there and show the world that you're rich by buying these white garments looking good, all these Gucci belts and stuff. Go ahead and uh, get your white garments for me. Let me clothe you, because when I clothe you, not only will you be clothed and covered, but people won't be able to see your nakedness. They won't be able to see your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities, because I am covering you. What does he also say? He says, purchase your salve from me. Back in those days, salve was pretty expensive or hard to make. So if it was hard to make, made it even more expensive. If they could make it pretty easily, they definitely charge a pretty penny for it because it was a hot commodity. What he's saying is don't find your security in your modern medicines that you can afford that many others can't, that you separate yourself to see that to say that you've prospered or that you don't need anything, start to purchase yourself from me. Let the great physician actually open your eyes the way that they need to be open so that you see the things that are actually in front of you the way that you need to see them. Family, look, Jesus is being very point blank with them. And he also finishes that out and says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. We have to understand that Jesus loves us so much that, yes, he'll tell us about ourselves, but that shouldn't discourage us. What it should do is amp us up even more. There's a phrase that people use nowadays when it's about gassing people up. They say putting a battery in somebody's back. And what that means is that you're just kind of charging them and getting them ready to go. Christ reproof and discipline shouldn't shut us down and discourage us like it does for many of us Western Christians. Many of us leave churches or leave uh, leave any sign of accountability when it comes down to reproof and discipline. But Christ says that his reproof and discipline is only for those who love. So <laughs> be zealous, anticipate it, be glad in it and repent turn, Matthew 13, verse 15, right? Sure enough, we come on down a little bit more. And as I close, due to time's sake, family, I want you to read this with me. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, eat with him, and he with me. Family, turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 34 through 37 when you get the time, and you'll be able to see uh, just another illustration of what that means when... God is knocking on your door and you let him in. He says that he will eat with you. And not only will he eat with you, uh, but it says right here in verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne with King Jesus. Come on, family, sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Family, as I close, I want you to understand what Jesus has to say. Jesus also says something that I believe in full heartedly, especially after a great lesson. He says in verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Family, the church is not just the brick and mortar building. Family, the church is not just the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The church includes you. All those seven churches, you'll find yourself recollected with them. All those seven churches, whether it's good or bad, you more than likely can see yourself in them just like you should be able to see yourself in the multiple soul, uh, soils from the parable of the sower. But either way that it goes, what I want us to ultimately see and take from this lesson is that Jesus Christ has something for us. Many of us are already familiar with it. We need to live every day as if it's that valuable. Because when we go out into the world and we remind them that they are living without something, saving power, salvation, eternity, then family, we ourselves must believe it as well. Have that fervent fire inside of us that says, amen, praise the Lord. Salvation has been brought down and it is mine. Family, I love you with the love of the Lord and I want you to go out and have a great week. You are saved once you have done the things that Christ needs you to do to be in him.
and he will keep you until you die once you are in him. But first get in him. Trust and believe, family. Trust in the promises of God and believe in his word. And until we meet again, I love you. Peace. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, say that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only first in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun. Heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day, this life, and its many blessings, and we thank you for this opportunity that we had to worship you today, dear God, and we pray that everything that we said and did is pleasing to you. We pray at this time for the elders of our local congregation, dear God, that you would give them wisdom and that they would be able to work with this church in a way that we would have unity and continue to grow. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be with our brothers Mitch and Zach, that you would bless them and their families, and that they would be able to spread the gospel in this community and, and much good would be done as a result. Lord, we have many that are sick. We pray that you would be with them and bless them and those that are administering to them, that they might be brought to a full portion of health soon. And Lord, we pray for our doctors and scientists that they would come up with a vaccination soon for COVID-19 so that we might all come to a normal portion of life. Be with us throughout this week and bless us. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to thank you again for joining us in today's worship service. If you would like to have more information about our sermons or Bible studies and want to contact us, you can reach me at Mitch at FranklinChurchOfChrist.com or go to our website or Facebook. We're at www.FranklinChurchOfChrist.com or Facebook.com forward slash Franklin Church of Christ. Again, thanks for being with us today. And until next time, God bless you.